March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake struck just off the coast of northeastern Japan. It was the tsunami that followed that no one had predicted. estimated 19,000 people lost their lives. As a journalist who's covered many natural disasters, this one was unique. Never before had I seen so much destruction in a country so advanced. The two million people who live in Fukushima prefecture, however, thought they were protected from the destruction on the coast. They were wrong. The wave had hit the nuclear power plant at Fukushima. The damage it caused sparked a reaction that would dwarf the tsunami and potentially threaten more lives. Pumps that cooled the nuclear reactors had stopped. The backup systems failed, although the Japanese government would take months to admit it. The Fukushima plant had gone into meltdown. Correspondent Ivor Bennett, who is in Tokyo for us. Now, Ivor, uh, can you just bring us the latest on this uh, worrying development with the uh, nuclear power plant? Well, the latest that I'm hearing is that they're not entirely sure what the cause of this white smoke we're seeing rising from the plant. The, the image is being shown on Japanese TV right now. Government spokesman has said that they're not entirely sure it was caused by an explosion, but the worry is that uh, one of the, or two of the reactors even, out of the five at this plant in Fukushima, around 160 miles north of uh, Tokyo, uh, the worry is that they're going into meltdown because they've lost uh, the, uh, the ability to cool down radioactive materials that the earthquake uh, yesterday has knocked out the cooling system there and also just hearing a report from a government official there as well that one of the reactors in that plant has actually uh, had atomic materials seeping out from it which is a major concern obviously and now uh, five other reactors uh, are also under a state of emergency again worries over the cooling systems there. Well should there be um a nuclear disaster there. What, what, what could the consequences be? What, what has been the reaction? Uh, how, how are they gauging the possible consequences of what's currently unfolding? Well, the consequences are obviously a massive nuclear fallout and we're hearing already on the wires that, uh, associated press that radioactive levels in that area around Fukushima Daiichi, that nuclear power plant where there has been a, a suspected or unconfirmed reports of, a, of an explosion, their radioactive levels there are, have risen a thousand times above normal. Now, on the streets here in Tokyo, I haven't been here long, but people seem unperturbed that I've spoken to, at least, and that was on the train from the airport. Uh, people were more worried about getting to their destinations here on the street. No one's around, so either people have fled the city or they're simply staying indoors. The but at the moment it seems that uh, it's the central part of the Pacific uncertainty really uh, about what's happening and I'm reading on Twitter as well that people in the north of Japan simply don't really know what's going on. They know people in Tokyo are worried. They aren't hearing themselves uh, what the situation is. Given the extreme force of the quake, I can't rule out the possibility that it damaged some of the piping. That might have caused air to leak out, disabling the vent as a result. Therefore, I find it extremely important to thoroughly investigate that possibility. TAPCO's investigators said in their report that few facilities were found to have been damaged by the quake. That includes those built to lower standards of quake resistance.
Was there really no impact on the pipes that were so critical for venting the reactor? For instance, was there any leakage between the source of the air and the valve? I doubt if they've checked everything on that level. In other words, no one can tell why venting failed or if the piping was damaged by the quake until they've looked at the actual material. So that's one of the things I think will be done expeditiously if we are to continue to operate nuclear plants. While responders were struggling to vent the reactor, the pressure inside the dry well rose far above permitted levels by the night of March 14th. News of the tense situation reached the Prime Minister's office in Tokyo. We will overcome this crisis at all costs. At this stage, then Prime Minister Naoto Khan went to TEPCO headquarters to speak with the management. At the main control room of reactor number two, all the workers could do was to repeat their fruitless efforts to release the pressure in the reactor. Alarming dry well pressure readings rang out in the on-site headquarters, but there was no good news. As I was hearing the readings, I felt myself plunging into total despair. After all, listening to the reports was all I could do, even though I knew everyone was working as hard as they could. Then at 6 a.m. on March 15th. Pressure was zero. Frontline workers thought part of the primary containment vessel had been destroyed, releasing a massive amount of radioactive material. If the containment vessel had really been destroyed rather than just experiencing a minor leak, that could have meant evacuating everyone. Could have been fatal for those of us on the front lines. And that's what crossed my mind. What had happened to the containment vessel? More than a year later, no one seems to know. But 
an enormous amount of radioactive fallout was likely released after 6 a.m. on March 15th. This photo offers evidence of all the radioactive releases following the Fukushima crisis. This one caused the greatest damage to residents. You've been watching NHK Newsline and we'll give you the update on the Fukushima nuclear power plant explosion. An explosion was heard at 6.14 a.m. Japan time on Tuesday at the number two reactor in the Fukushima number one nuclear power plant. As of 6.14, at the at reactor number two, uh, Fukushima number one a nuclear power plant, uh, there was an explosive sound heard and uh, the uh, pressure within the suppression pool went down and we believe that some kind of damage could have been caused. However, we will continue our efforts to inject water into the reactor. However, the people who are not directly involved in the water injection operation have been evacuated to safer locations. Tokyo Electric Power Company says radiation level hit 8,217 microsieverts after the explosion. The figure is three times the amount that people would normally be exposed to in one year. It also says the valve to vent steam and reduce pressure inside the reactor had closed and they're trying to open it. It says it cannot deny the possibility that the fuel rods are melting. Reporting at the moment that there are suggestions that a partial nuclear meltdown is now underway. Can you explain to us what does that mean exactly? Um, yeah, what it means is that the nuclear fuel has become brittle uh, and that's evident because of the hydrogen explosions that have occurred. That process makes nuclear fuel brittle and the pieces of nuclear fuel inside are about as big as my pinky that join on my pinky, they have all fallen into the bottom of the nuclear reactor. There are thousands and thousands of those pieces. In the center of those pieces is molten uranium. Um, it's, this is not a nuclear chain reaction. This is not a, a nuclear bomb. This is the radiation left over after the chain reaction has started. Um, this, this will go on for several months. And um, the heat's got to be removed. Okay. And if you can't... Okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you say this is not a nuclear bomb, but would not the effects be the same as a nuclear bomb if obviously it does reach meltdown and there is an explosion? The chemicals that are going to be released are similar. Actually, the chemicals released from a... radioactive chemicals released from a nuclear bomb disappear quicker than the radiation that uh, is released in a nuclear power plant. The uh, fission spectrum in a nuclear power plant has longer lived radiation than the fission spectrum in a, uh, in a bomb. But are we looking at an apocalypse? Uh, I, I read online reports on websites looking at international newspapers. That word is used many times. Exaggeration or is that true? Well, uh, my term is this is Chernobyl on steroids. This, is, uh, this will be worse than Chernobyl. Exactly how much worse, I don't know, but um, it's pretty clear to me that, um, that it will be worse than Chernobyl. You say will be. Do you think it's definitely going to happen, or do you think crisis could be averted? No, I don't think crisis can be averted. Uh, these can, uh, the radiation exposures are so high on site that I don't think um, human beings can, uh, can get into the areas that need to be accessed in order to put, the fire, um, to put the fires out and also to get water into the locations where the, um, the, the heat is the highest. Now, in Japan, the government uh, and the plants operated TEPCO have come under heavy criticism from many quarters for the reliability of the information that they've been releasing about this disaster. Do you think that we now know the true extent of this crisis? No, I know that we don't, because I've actually visited there and I've taken uh, quite sophisticated radiation measuring equipment and I've been able to, to satisfy myself that the concentrations of radionuclides on the ground, even as far as 100 and more kilometers away from the plant, are very much higher than they've been saying. And indeed, some measurements that I've been making on air filters from vehicles from as far away as Tokyo show that the concentrations of cesium-137, for example, in these filters is more than 1,000 times 
times higher than, uh, in terms of air concentration than the air concentration at the peak of the weapons fallout in 1963. So we're talking about serious, serious levels of radioactive nuclides. And the problem is that, that, that this is effectively being ignored by, by, by the authorities concentrating on the external dose rate. So they say, so long as the external dose rate is not more than so many microsieverts per hour or whatever it happens to be, everybody's going to be safe. In some sense, they're comparing it with natural background radiation. But actually, it cannot be compared with natural background radiation. The rep the, 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 the very, very high level of contamination, even as far south as Tokyo. For example, we found one sample in Tokyo that had levels of radioactivity higher than levels inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone. It's a very serious matter. So High levels of radiation have reached Tokyo following the accident at Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant. People in the capital have been told not to drink tap water. The country's struggle to resolve its nuclear crisis has again been stalled, with workers at the Fukushima plant evacuated after black smoke emerged from one of its reactors. RT's Igor Agorodnev is in the Japanese capital. Another setback for the shutdown operation at Fukushima. Workers had to be withdrawn once smoke began billowing from one of the reactors for a fear of contamination. Now, this time it's reactor number three, perhaps the most dangerous of the lot because it operates on plutonium. Plutonium has a much longer half-life than uranium and if it were ever to get out into the environment, there would be a very expensive and very difficult clean-up operation. This, of course, Mars, what has been a um, last few days, a very steady progress. The engineers have now managed to connect up all of the reactors to some electricity. In fact, electricity has been restored in one of the control rooms. Uh, they're saying that if this operation continues successfully, despite the recent setback, that eventually they'll be able to put the cooling systems back into action. And the cooling systems will now then cool the rods, and therefore any immediate risk of contamination will then have been avoided. Here in Tokyo, the dangers of radiation are coming from different directions. First, it was the vegetables and the fruit which were produced in the area near Fukushima, which were becoming contaminated. Now, the authorities are saying that the levels of radiation in the water are also rising and now uh, babies and small children have been banned from drinking tap water because the levels are apparently dangerous to them. Apparently it's okay for adults but at the same time I'm doubting that a lot of people are risking it and in fact if you go into the shops the bottled water is still going at a very fast rate so people are not risking drinking water from their taps. There is a lot of rain which has been falling here over the last few days and it's been dropping, if not significant, but noticeable levels of radiation and we've been walking around the city measuring the radiation levels. In some of the streets it's higher by five, six times than it's supposed to be, even though the overall indicators are normal. Nevertheless, the authorities are asking their citizens to stay calm. The day after the earthquake, Tokyo Electric Power Company's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was in a dire situation. At 5.44 a.m., the government ordered the evacuation of 50,000 citizens. The evacuation zone was expanded from 3 kilometers to 10 kilometers. At this point, a crucial evacuation route was the road stretching from the plant towards Miharu, Route 288. Vast numbers of residents from towns like Okuma, situated near the plant, headed over the Abukuma Mountains to Miharu. After March 12th, the town hall became the emergency response headquarters of Miharu. At the headquarters, support was being provided to residents affected by the disaster. Kuniharu Hashimoto, who was heading up the operation, received a call. It was a request for Miharu to take in evacuees. I got a call from the police on the morning of March 12th saying that people were being evacuated and asking how many people Miharu could take in. 
We already had our hands full looking after the residents of Miharu. When I asked how many people, the police first said 700, and we felt we could handle them. So a few members of our staff started preparations. But in reality, 5,000 evacuees descended upon the town. Nine evacuation shelters took in 2,000 people, but that was the limit. That afternoon, a hydrogen explosion hit Reactor 1. It was plain to see that the crisis was worsening. The 10-kilometer evacuation zone that was supposedly an extra precaution was now widened to 20 kilometers. Meanwhile, town officials were making the rounds of the shelters dotted around Miharu. Chisato Takenouchi, a public health nurse, was giving advice to evacuees. From there to there, nearly 30 trucks from the self-defense forces were stretched all the way down. And there were also nearly 20 big tourist buses in the open space over there. The town's gymnasium was overflowing with people who had fled with only the clothes on their backs. Takenouchi went from one person to the next, listening to their health problems. A pregnant woman from a town near the power plant had a question about some tablets she had gotten hold of. It was the first time Takenouchi had ever seen these round tablets in their yellow packet. Neither I nor the other nurse on duty had ever seen these tablets. So we were asking, where did you get these? What were you told when you got them? She was told before leaving that it was iodine for the thyroid and to take it before being exposed to radiation. She'd been told it was up to her whether or not to take it, so she asked us what she should do. We couldn't answer then and there, so we asked her to wait until we went back and did some research, and she said that was okay. Takenouchi returned to the Public Health and Welfare Division and explained what had happened at the shelter. She consulted a veteran in the field, Division Director Hiroyuki Kudo. He was in charge of the townspeople's health management. She also asked public health nurse Miyoko Sakuma. Neither knew about the tablets. I simply didn't have a clue what it was, and even when I looked at its name, I was stumped. I didn't know anything about it, and so I needed to do some research to find out more. The next day, Kudo and his public health and welfare team began their research in earnest. The tablets were stable iodine, an important drug that can protect against exposure to radiation. Stable iodine tablets work in the following way. The radioactive iodine that is emitted in a nuclear accident tends to be absorbed by the thyroid located in the neck. This can lead to cancer. However, by taking non-radioactive stable iodine tablets beforehand, it is possible to block the radioactive iodine. On rare occasions, there are side effects. An allergy to iodine can cause a rash or a fever. The distribution of the tablets requires authorization from the national or prefectural government and the presence of a medical professional. The tricky part is when to take the tablets. 
when taken 24 hours before radiation exposure, the tablets have a 93% protective effect. But as time passes, their effectiveness diminishes. Taken 8 hours after exposure, they are 40% effective. And 24 hours after, it's down to just 7%. It's crucial that the tablets be taken at the right time. Takenouchi became aware of the invisible dangers of radiation for the first time. I read through some literature and I started getting really scared. I wondered if we were even actually safe here, and thinking about my own exposure to radiation as well, I started getting really worried. It was then I realized for the first time the gravity of the situation. The next day, March 15th, the remaining reactor buildings suffered explosions and fires. There was an even larger release of radioactive material. living within a 30 kilometer radius to stay indoors. However, Minami Soma decided on a temporary evacuation of residents. Out of a population of 70,000, 60,000 left the city. residents, about half its pre-disaster population. The dose of radiation received outdoors in the center of town is more than three millisieverts per year. That is more than triple the ordinary internationally accepted exposure limit for urban residents. What are the effects of such a high dosage of radiation? That is not completely known. What is the latest out of Fukushima? Well, um, the WHO at the United Nations, which is the World Health Organization, did admit just yesterday that there's a 70% uh, increase in thyroid cancer among young girls exposed to the radioactive of iodine-131. That should be expected to happen. But Greenpeace International did a good job of showing that even that figure, as shocking as it is, uh, is downplaying the situation. Already we've seen not a 1% increase in expected cancers uh, in that prefecture, but we're talking a third of the children in Fukushima prefecture have abnormalities with their thyroid glands. We don't know how many of those will turn into cancers, but at Chernobyl in Ukraine and Belarus and Western Russia, there was a dramatic increase in childhood thyroid cancers. Yeah, that's tragic. Kevin Camps, thanks so much for being with us tonight. We visited a debris storage site in Ishinomaki City, Miyagi Prefecture. Due to cleanup delays, the piles had grown to more than 20 meters. According to the Environment Ministry, the disaster left behind 4.64 million tons of debris in Ishinomaki. Without outside help, it would take more than 80 years for the city to clean it all up. Buried in the piles were a wide range of everyday items. The bits and pieces are sad reminders of destroyed lives. This pipe lets out the heat. Carbon monoxide, uh, mercury sulfide, and methane are being produced inside. The fermenting debris produces gas and accumulates heat. If excess heat remains trapped inside, the debris could burst into flame.
25 fires have broken out at debris storage sites in Miyagi Prefecture. Massive outbreaks of flies were also reported in summer. Why has the cleanup of the debris made no progress more than one year after the disaster? We decided to find out. The disaster produced 20 million tons of debris, the largest volume ever. It's hampering efforts to rebuild affected areas. Factories remain in shambles. There seems to be no end to the human exodus. Five years or ten years, I probably might be around when it's all cleared up. I'm worried the whole town will disappear. Efforts are underway to dispose of the debris outside areas hit by the disasters. But such plans are often met with strong protests from residents worried about radioactivity. You say it's safe, but we're not convinced. We won't accept it. What's more, debris that washed out to sea is now drifting on the Pacific Ocean. has reached U.S. and Canadian shores and begun causing serious problems. Even a 20-meter long floating dock made it to the other side of the Pacific. This would be tsunami debris. We're finding these on the outside coast everywhere now, which we never found before. We don't know how we're going to clean it up. Last year's tsunami left more than 18 million tons of debris in its wake. Disposing of the remains is proving to be a major and costly problem. The central government is hoping municipalities around the country will help with the cleanup, but few have stepped forward. NHK World's Misato Ishikawa has more. The city of Ishinomaki in Miyagi Prefecture has the largest amount of debris among all the tsunami hit regions, about 5 million tons. Those piles pose a problem. The temperature inside of this pile is about 80 degrees Celsius. Last August, one of the piles actually caught on fire. The government has been struggling to transfer the debris to temporary storage sites. Only half of the debris in Ishinomaki has so far been collected. There is just too much and no more places to store it. Temperatures will rise in summer and flies could transmit infection. I don't think we can proceed with reconstruction or even dream of the future as long as the debris remains. The government aims to dispose of all the debris by March 2014. Part of its disposal plan would see municipalities around the country accept some two and a half million tons. So far, six local governments have agreed, but they are willing to take just over one million tons, about 43 percent of the target amount. Many local governments are reluctant to help out over concerns of radioactive contamination. Recently, assembly members from Aichi Prefecture visited the site in Miyagi Prefecture to see a disposal facility. They are hoping to reassure skeptical residents in Aichi. That's a bag filter on the side where hazardous substances are broken up into small particles and get sucked up. So what's coming out of it is steam, not smoke. People in Japan are critical of the slow disposal pace. 
They also say the government is not releasing information on the safety of the delay quickly enough. Facing growing criticism, the government in October set radioactive safety limits at between 240 and 480 becquerels per kilogram after consulting international organizations. Officials in Aichi are considering whether to accept the debris. The safety standards are not trusted by people in Japan. Aichi Prefecture will set a stricter standard than the national one. But the residents of Aichi are not as accepting about taking the re as the prefecture authority and local assembly members. A Toyota factory in Tahala City is one of the candidate sites that the Aichi governor says will receive the re. Masanobu Nagata heads a citizen's group that is campaigning against accepting the re. He worked as a radiation technologist at the hospital for 25 years before becoming a farmer. Nature still exists here. I feel that the potatoes we grow taste better. Joined by like-minded citizens, Nagata continues studying radioactive contaminants from the debris. We have to protect our children. We shouldn't let our town accept the debris without having further confirmation. The safety limits sharply deviate from waste disposal standards set in the past. They will allow contaminated materials to be moved around the nation and destroy Japan's beautiful nature. One year after the March 11th disaster, fears of radioactive contamination are keeping local governments around the country from agreeing to accept the brief for disposal. This has left the government in the position where it may not be able to live up to its pledge of completing the disaster cleanup by 2014. NHK has learned that some contractors in Japan fail to pay a special allowance to workers who receive radio, who remove rather radioactive fallout from the Fukushima nuclear accident. The Japanese government has commissioned major, major construction companies to carry out the decontamination, but the actual work is performed by subcontractors. The government pays a risk allowance of $110 per day in addition to a daily wage to people who work in places with relatively high levels of radiation. NHK found that two subcontractors hired to work in a city in Fukushima Prefecture did not pay the allowance. Several workers say they were told they would receive $110 per day with free accommodation and meals when they started their jobs in mid-2012. They say their employers did not mention the special allowance. The workers say that between November and December, the subcontractors presented them with a new document about their working conditions. The allowance was paid on paper, but the daily wage was cut to $67 with accommodation and meal expenses deducted from the payment. Well, it seems as if the longer this system of cheating workers continues, the less people would want to do this job. The subcontractors reportedly asked the workers to sign the document as if it were the original. The employers reportedly have admitted it was a fake. The workers say their employers apparently tried to conceal the non-payment of the risk allowance. The labor ministry says at least eight companies failed to make the necessary payment. Japan's nuclear regulators have been discussing how to safeguard power plants against the kind of accident that crippled Fukushima Daiichi. They've drafted an outline of new safety standards for nuclear facilities. Nuclear regulation authority officials are proposing new filtered vents for the powered plants. The vents would reduce pressure in the containment vessel and filter contaminated steam. Workers struggled to control the pressure inside the Fukushima reactors after the 2011 tsunami. The watchdog officials are considering a proposal to build standalone facilities to cool damaged reactors. Workers would inject water from a safe distance. The nuclear regulatory body will release a final draft by the end of this month. The
proposals will then face a public review. The regulators are expected to announce the new standards by July. Japanese government officials are investigating workers involved in the nuclear cleanup in Fukushima. They suspect some are endangering citizens by dumping radioactive material. Contractors have been working on the cleanup since July. They have to seal and store radioactive material. But officials with the Environment Ministry are looking into reports that some dumped soil and vegetation in rivers and didn't collect the water they'd used. The officials say they plan to question the workers and find out whether other contractors are also breaking the rules. They say violators face up to five years in jail or a fine of more than $100,000. Environment Ministry officials in Japan are turning to experts for advice on their plan to store dirt and other contaminated debris uh, contaminated by the 2011 nuclear accident. Workers have been removing topsoil from the ground in Fukushima in their effort to decontaminate the area. Now, the government plans to construct intermediate storage facilities in three towns near the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The debris will be kept there until final disposal sites are built. But some residents are against the idea because they're concerned about high levels of radiation. In response, the Environment Ministry is assembling panels of experts to confirm the safety of the plan. Geologists will check the ground under the site to make sure it's stable. The experts will also give advice on the structure of the facilities as well as safety measures. Another panel of experts will discuss how to conserve the environment around the sites. The panels will hold their first meetings before the end of the month. One year on, and Mrs. Ahashi is taking her children to the doctor. Kana, the eldest, Kazuaki, her son, and the youngest, Mana. They've been sick frequently over the last 12 months. Nosebleeds, diarrhea, sore throats, symptoms that disappeared when they went away, but returned when they came back to Fukushima. The eldest one went away during the summer. When she came back in November, she had mouth blisters. But from mid-December when she went away again, the blisters went away. On a sheet, she lists the symptoms. Before the tsunami, she says the kids were all in very good health. Now they're picking up every little bug going around. It's not exactly what the Ahashi family wants to hear, but they're taking matters into their own hands. Mrs. Ahashi is preparing dinner. She uses only produce she's certain has come from far away. The government says these things are safe, she tells me, but she just doesn't want to think about it anymore. She's too tired. And the kids are playing. They're locked inside. Kazuaki still has flu, and Mrs. Ahashi doesn't want to take any chances. They won't be allowed to play outside until the school holidays come and the family can take a holiday far away. But high in the mountains, above the reach of the radiation scattered below, is one small sanctuary. Naoyuki Hashiguchi is doing his regular checks. He knows the levels here are low, but he's leaving nothing to chance. Today the level is way below 0.1, so it's very low, and far lower than most areas around here. And then they arrive. This is only the third time these children have been allowed to play outside since the disaster struck. The excitement and release of being in the open air is clear to see. called Let's Play Outside is aimed at giving the kids a chance to play without the fear of radiation exposure. The pain the children have gone through is so great they could never even begin to understand it. But there are also many children who are suffering today from the long-term impact of radiation. The 
the children are clearly thrilled. It doesn't take long before they're lost in the fun and games. But Mr. Hashiguchi knows it'll only last for a few hours, and then they'll have to return to reality. Children know that Fukushima is going through very difficult times, and for their own families. Their parents might lose their jobs. They might have to move or change school, or even evacuate. Children have to deal with tremendous stress and worry. They have no hope. The children of Fukushima, the generation scarred by the tsunami wave. I'm not going to 
Tayo hasn't spent a single night in this house since the nuclear accident. He drops by here after school to wait for his parents to pick him up. You can't sleep here? Yeah. I don't know. What do you mean? It's not something a kid can decide. Today, only Tayo's grandparents live here. Even his parents won't stay here. Radiation is really scary. It is. It ruins your life. People can't enjoy themselves. Is there anything that bothers you? The thing that bothers me is that I can't live normally like I used to. I used to eat meals with my grandpa and grandma. I hope we can live together again. Welcome to today's close-up. I'm Hiroko Kuniya. Nuclear experts say it will take 40 years to remove all the spent fuel rods from the storage pools, take out fuel rods from three reactors in which a meltdown took place, and dismantle all the reactors, a task of unprecedented difficulty. About 3,000 people currently work at the plant each day. Some are being forced to leave because their accumulated amount of exposure to radiation has exceeded the legal limit. The operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, needs enough experienced workers until the end of the 40-year decommissioning process. But these days many are leaving and this is causing anxiety. Will there be enough workers to complete the operation? Tokyo Electric, or TEPCO, has a legal responsibility to decommission the reactors. It is maintained that there is no shortage of workers and that there won't be for at least five more years. But an NHK investigation has shown that the number of workers TEPCO claimed to have secured was not quite credible. This is the contract system for the decommissioning. TEPCO hires 30 major companies on contract who then give the work to more than 300 subcontractors. An NHK crew interviewed workers from more than 50 contractors and subcontractors as well as those from TEPCO to find out about the working environment and why so many are leaving the plant. A year and a half after a massive earthquake and subsequent tsunami left the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan severely damaged, the plant's authorities are still scrambling to find space to store the tens of thousands of tons of highly contaminated water that was used to cool the broken reactors. And the problem is far from contained. The water is stored in gigantic tanks surrounding the Daiichi power plant and TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, has been working to clear more room for a volume of water that's expected to more than triple in the next three years. Finding a place to store over 200,000 tons of radioactive water is no easy task, especially with the added factor that Japan is an island nation highly susceptible to earthquakes and tsunamis. And if the situation in Japan isn't daunting enough, it becomes more complicated when you throw in the fact that nuclear authorities are entangled with the Yakuza, Japan's most notorious crime syndicate. That's right. According to Japanese government sources, the Yakuza has a long history of involvement in Japan's nuclear industry that dates back over a decade. Undercover reporters have exposed TEPCO payoffs to the Yakuza to keep quiet about safety issues and potential scandals. Look, we already know that TEPCO is corrupt as hell. In fact, 
They knew that the reactors were faulty, and they even falsified documents in the past to downplay the poor conditions of the reactors years before the disaster. So, who is TEPCO having work on the disaster cleanup? Well, unfortunately, a group of veteran engineers called the Skilled Veterans Corps for Fukushima has been denied access to clean up the radioactive mess. The Skilled Veterans Corps is made up of 700 plus retired workers from the Fukushima plant. Many of them elders who expect to die of natural causes long before the long-term effects of radiation exposure could make them sick. Aside from the fact that these men are willing to lay down their lives for the cleanup effort, I find it mind-boggling to believe that TEPCO is denying them access. It starts to make sense, however, when you take into account the outsourcing of organized crime labor by TEPCO. The arrest of a Yakuza boss who allegedly supplied workers for reconstruction efforts is helping shine a light on the whole operation. Japanese law enforcement officials have disclosed that starting in May of last year, gang members were sent to the damaged reactors. Where they performed cleanup work and began rebuilding damaged areas. The subcontractor for TEPCO then awarded the extra hazard pay to the crime boss, and a portion of the money was used to settle debts with the crime syndicate. Now, while you might be thinking that gang members and criminals going in to help clean up a nuclear disaster sounds like a good idea, think about it this way. These workers are being sacrificed to do this job because they are indebted to the mob. They are desperate for work, and many of them have little to no experience being sent to what they're doing. Think about what I just said. This may be the most important aspect of all. A nuclear disaster resulting from three major nuclear meltdowns is unfolding by the minute, and who's sent to work on it? Gang members with no experience. The cleanup efforts must be worked on properly or could result in the spread of 85 times the amount of dangerous CS-137 isotope that the Chernobyl disaster sent around the world. Listen, guys, this is insane. If the potential for a global catastrophe isn't opening people's eyes to the technological insanity that is nuclear energy, then I don't know what will. The idea of nuclear energy does not account for human error, Mother Nature's wrath, and the impossibility of storing the waste. We clearly can't count on the industry or the government to look out for the people of this planet. We are the ones who need to demand an end to this madness. People in northeastern Japan have spent nearly two years getting over what they lost and in getting back on their feet. Next Monday marks the second anniversary of the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear accident. The disaster killed nearly 16,000 people. About 2,700 others are still listed as missing. People across the northeast are moving forward on a path to recovery. They've worked to rebuild their homes, their communities and their lives. We'll be spending the lead up to March the 11th looking at how far they've come and the challenges that still lie ahead. And perhaps the biggest one is the damaged nuclear plant in Fukushima. Areas around the facility shown here in red are still off limits. About 160,000 people from Fukushima prefecture are still unable to go home. The earthquake and tsunami triggered a total blackout at Fukushima Daiichi. Workers with Tokyo Electric Power Company were unable to keep the fuel inside the reactors cool. Meltdowns happened inside three of the facility's six reactors. The temperature of the fuel continued to rise. Hydrogen built up and sparked explosions. The blast damaged reactor buildings and released massive amounts of radiation into the environment. Two years on, TEPCO officials say the situation is stable. They say water circulation systems are keeping the nuclear fuel cool. And they say the plant is no longer releasing significant amounts of radioactive materials. Crews will one day dismantle and decommission the four crippled reactors. Japanese leaders have announced the entire operation could take up to 40 years. But TEPCO engineers admit they have no firm timeline and no firm plan for moving the molten fuel. NHK World's Yoichiro Tatewa spoke with the utility's top official in charge of nuclear power. Akira Kawano has been an engineer at TEPCO for almost 30 years. He was in charge of safety at Fukushima Daiichi before the accident. Now he supervised the commissioning process. 
what do you think the, the most difficult part, the difficult element uh, concerning the, the commissioning process? Two <coughs> difficult challenges. Um, the one is uh, how to understand the inside the uh, reactor pressure vessel and the primary containment vessel. And to remove the uh, molten fuel debris from the unit one through three. The other challenge uh, is that uh, how to <coughs> cope with uh, waste. It's a liquid waste and uh, solid waste. Uh, how to treat them and how to s safely store it uh, for the long time. TEPCO engineers are still trying to understand the situation inside the reactors. They are using fiber optic scopes and closed circuit cameras to gather images of the damage. They are also using computer simulations to determine the condition of the molten fuel. But high levels of radiation are slowing things down. Workers can only go into reactor buildings for 5 to 10 minutes at a time. We haven't understood well uh, how those uh, uh, molten fuel debris are distributed and located. We need to uh, sample the debris and uh, we need to understand the mechanical character characteristics and chemical characteristics of the debris. So otherwise uh, uh, we cannot develop the uh, necessary tool to remove, re retrieve the debris. I hope we'd like to understand some something about it uh, within a couple of years. It, it takes a long time to, to uh, it's just, it's a difficult to uh, achieve it. Can we really say that the uh, decommissioning process will end within 40 years? It's very difficult to talk about uh, uh, such a far future, but uh, it's really the, uh, takes a time, actually. So even just for the removal of the debris, and it takes uh, 10 years or more, I think. And you know, the uh, half-life of the, the, for example, the cesium is uh, 30 years, so some part of the decommissioning we need to wait <laughs> the radiation will be reduced there are different ways to decommission a nuclear plant but they all involve risks given the state of Fukushima Daiichi Kawano and his team need to account for unprecedented challenges when they choose options he believes TEPCO executives will have to discuss it with stakeholders and explain the risks of the options before they decide what course of action they should take. We really need to uh, improve our capability of the risk communication in future. That's uh, also our challenge. <laughs> Regarding also the decommissioning, we need to share that information. Another major issue, as Kawano mentioned, is the toxic waste on site at Fukushima Daiichi. Every day, 400 tons of groundwater seeps into the highly radioactive units. Engineers pump it from buildings and into special tanks. They're in a constant race to build enough storage capacity to prevent any leaks into the environment. It's really impossible just to continuously accumulate that water in the tank. It's not a reasonable way. So we need to think about the possibility of discharge or the other alternative ways, like uh, evaporation or something like that. TEPCO engineers are planning to introduce a new device. They say it's capable of removing all radioactive isotopes from the water. Kawano says the manager needs to talk to local residents in order to decide how to resolve this problem. Looking ahead, 
engineers have started updating the decommissioning roadmap. The government place the entire process would take 40 years. Right now, there is no concrete plan in place to fit that timeline. Well, this week marks the anniversary of the atomic catastrophes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Today, Japanese attention turns to other nuclear concerns. Tensions in Japan are rising over the radioactive water leaking into the Pacific Ocean from the country's crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, which was devastated by the earthquakes and tsunami of 2011. Joining me now in studio to discuss the radioactive leak is Paul Gunter, director of the Reactor Oversight Project at BeyondNuclear.org. Thank you for being here, Paul. We really Thank you very your much. Presence. Now, I'm going to start off by asking you, can you tell us how long the contaminated water has been, how long the contamination has been leaking into the water? Very likely since the uh, explosions and the meltdown at uh, Fukushima Daiichi in March of uh, 2011. Wow, that, that is quite a long time. Now, how much and what sort of radiation is leaking into the Pacific? I know there's all different types, so if you can explain that right. in a little detail. Well, clearly what we've seen now is the movement of radioactive hydrogen, tritium, uh, which uh, is a uh, mobile uh, radioactive isotope, but clearly um, radioactive cesium-134, 137, strontium-90. We're seeing a full range of radioactive contaminants now moving, which indicate that uh, the damaged cores of these reactors, the meltdowns themselves, uh, have are now contributing to the contamination of the Pacific Ocean and groundwater that's moving at a, about a, a rate of a 300 to 400 uh, uh, metric tons. Uh, per day. So, but these uh, numbers are really um, only approximations and will vary, but clearly a lot of radioactivity is moving through groundwater into the ocean. Now, why is the plan continuing to leak? You'd think they would have, or maybe they already have, taken steps to contaminate some of this leakage. Well, they, um, they have, you know, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, put up a temporary wall between the uh, reactor wreckage and the uh, the ocean, but uh, this is really acted no, nothing more than just like a dam, so that the water is building up behind the dam, and now it's breached the dam, it's spilling over, and the radioactive contamination is moving into the Pacific. But um, it's uh, the, the, right now we're seeing the, the Japanese government is in chaos. Uh, this the fact that the revelation of this extensive contamination is coming now more than two years after the accident occurred. Uh, indicates that it's completely out of control mm -hmm. and uh, the command and control uh, is in chaos in Japan right now and and really the big question is why aren't they calling international aid to address the radioactive contamination of the Pacific Ocean why do you suspect they aren't calling international aid the the problems are I think clearly that uh, there's there's no transparency and the government and the industry as documented by the Japanese Diet, their Congress, is that there's been a collusion all along. And uh, so what we're seeing is a veil being drawn over the accident to, to uh, promote an agenda for continue the restart of these reactors in Japan and uh, to try to contain uh, the uh, bad news rather than the radiation. That's very concerning because the radiation is much worse than just the news itself. Now, what can be done beyond these dams that you mentioned before in terms of contaminating the leakage? Well, the, the, you know, in order to contain the leaks, we have to isolate the radioactive waste. But indications are right now that the reactor structures themselves have been breached. Uh, it's very likely that the, um, some of the radioactive material, the melted cores, have moved into the earth. And the uh, the so the containing it's beyond containment right now. I think that's the tragedy uh, that we see unfolding as Fukushima's radioactive water crisis is only beginning. That's very concerning. How far has this radiation spread, and how fast is it going while it spreads? Again, some of the radioactive isotopes are more mobile than others. The radioactive tritium, mm -hmm. uh, the hydrogen, it moves anywhere water goes because it is radioactive hydrogen and, and makes up a component of water. So um, the 
the spread of the contamination is only going to be as effectively monitored as the technology is out there. And frankly, we don't know the full extent. Uh, nobody really knows the full extent of the contamination at this point as it moves through uh, not only groundwater but also through the atmosphere and into ocean currents. So um, it, it, we're in a very grave situation right now as the, uh, the Japanese government has uh, declared this is a new radiation emergency coming out of a worsening situation at Fukushima Daiichi. Now what does this mean for the people of Japan and around the world? I think that certainly the concern right now is that the people of Japan want more transparency mm -hmm. into what their government is or is not doing about this uncontrolled radioactive catastrophe. Uh, the meetings that are going on right now between industry and government are behind closed doors. So the Japanese people are asking for more transparency to, uh, to get a better understanding of just how un out of control this whole situation is. Government figures show that as of last month, more than 300,000 people were still living in temporary housing with relatives or in other impermanent situations. We're all from Itate. All from Itate? Yes. We're members of the Chernobyl Club. Itate has the highest radiation. Yeah, the highest. We first visited District Number 6 in November of 2011. We can't go home. Not with all that radioactivity. Our mayor says it'll take two years, but... I think he's mistaking it for 20. <laughs> we may have to hold our funerals here. Lots of us are worried about that. Most of us are over 70. This place is dead. It's like being in jail. But we don't have guards to make us exercise. <laughs> it's like we did something wrong and got locked up. Authorities plan to build more than 23,000 public housing units for those who can't rebuild their homes. But as of last month, workers had only completed 80... March 11, 2011, 2.46 2 p.m. A powerful earthquake shakes Japan. It unleashes towering tsunami that devastate the northeast coast and send a nuclear plant spiraling out of control. Newsline has brought you stories of those who lost loved ones, of the struggle to rebuild communities and lives. People have made progress, but the road ahead is still long. Path to Recovery, three years on. People across Japan will pause on Tuesday to mark the third anniversary of the quake and tsunami. They'll honor the more than 18,000 people killed by the disaster and its lingering impact, and the roughly 2,600 people still considered missing. They'll also reflect on the continuing crisis at the nuclear plant in Fukushima. The work to decommission the facility is still in its early days and will stretch on for years. NHK World's Catherine Kobayashi is standing by about 20 kilometers from Fukushima Daiichi. Catherine. Yuko, I'm at the strategic base for the decommissioning of the plant's reactors. The thousands of workers involved in decommissioning the nuclear plant come through this facility every day. Now, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, operates it. This place is called J Village. And as I explain in just a moment, this facility was originally meant for a completely different purpose. Yuko? All right, thank you very much there, Catherine. We'll get back to you soon. First, let's take a look at how events unfolded at Fukushima Daiichi three years ago. A magnitude 9 earthquake triggered a gigantic tsunami off the coast of northeastern Japan. They knocked out all power sources and backup generators at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex, causing meltdowns in three reactors. Firefighters and self-defense force personnel 
were sent in to help stabilize the situation. The damaged reactors released enormous amounts of radioactive substances, contaminating vast areas both on land and at sea. Three years on, a large area around the plant remains uninhabited. Here's the layout of evacuation zones. In this area, shown in red, radiation exposure levels remain at least 50 times above the limit for the civilian population. The zone remains off limits. In orange areas, residents are allowed to visit their homes during the day, but they are not allowed to stay overnight. And radiation levels are comparatively low in the yellow areas. These zones are being decontaminated to allow evacuees to return. The total number of evacuees from these areas stands at 81,000. The nuclear accident also dealt a heavy blow to Fukushima's main industries, particularly fishing. The government adopted strict standards on radiation levels in seafood. They prevent fishermen from selling their catch if radioactive particles exceed 100 becquerels per kilogram. Shipments of seafood from Fukushima Prefecture only 2% of what they were before the disaster. Agriculture was also seriously affected by the accident. It remains at a standstill in evacuation zones, but the situation has improved outside those areas. Farmers there are once again able to ship their products after testing them for radiation. The volume of shipments is now back to about 80% of pre-disaster levels. Let's turn now to their situation at the nuclear plant itself. After the accident, Tokyo Electric Power Company built a system to inject cooling water into the reactor cores. The utility says the fuel that melted down is now stable. But the water used to cool it becomes highly contaminated and it's constantly accumulating in the basements of the compound. To prevent this water from overflowing and polluting the ocean, workers are storing it in hundreds of tanks. Thousands of workers are mobilized every day to decommission the plant. In many areas, they have to cope with very high levels of radiation. Now, for more on that, let's go back to Catherine at Jay Village. Catherine. Few people outside of Japan have heard of this facility, but as you know, Yuko, it's played a crucial role during the nuclear crisis. The J in J Village stands for Japan. It was built 17 years ago as the country's first national training center for soccer players. Now, take a look behind me at the parking lot. That used to be one of many soccer pitches here. One of the obvious traces left nowadays is the floodlights. The ground has been covered with gravel to make space for hundreds of vehicles. Now, Japanese leaders considered several factors when choosing this location and converting it to a major staging area for the decommissioning of the nuclear plant. The first was the location. This facility sits right on the edge of the 20-kilometer evacuation zone, and it's on the main road that leads directly to the nuclear plant. Self-defense force personnel and firefighters used that road right after the accident when they went in to help bring the situation under control. They used heavily armored vehicles to approach the reactors and fire trucks to douse the units with water. Now, another factor that they considered when converting this place into a major staging area for the decommissioning process was the amount of space, both indoors and out. J Village is huge. It's a 50-hectare property with 12 soccer fields. That means plenty of level ground for supplies and equipment. It's hard to imagine, Yuko, that just a few years ago, soccer fans came here to watch their national players train. Even the main stadium is completely different. The stands are still there, but the pitch has been converted to accommodate dormitories for the workers. 600 of them live here now. The clock on the scoreboard stopped right after the earthquake struck, and that's when J Village ceased to function as a sporting venue. Yuko? I see. So how has the facility's role changed over the past three years, Catherine? Well, the frontline tension that prevailed here in the early days of the crisis has subsided for the most part. The function of the facility has evolved in step with the situation at Fukushima Daiichi, and it's now a key part in managing what's become a long-term project. Work at the plant begins every day at dawn. 
As many as 2,000 workers report for duty at Jay Village. They board buses for the 40-minute ride to Fukushima Daiichi. After this point, access to the plant is severely restricted and only vehicles with a special permit can get in. J Village has become a crucial base for our operations at Fukushima Daiichi. TEPCO officials say they want to protect the privacy of contract workers, so you won't see their faces or hear from them directly. These workers have received encouragement from at home and abroad. The walls of the facility are covered with messages of support. During the day, J Village becomes a training center. Fresh recruits must attend different types of lectures. They learn about the dangers of radiation and how to minimize their exposure. Here, trainees find out how to properly wear a gas mask. More than 700 people entered this program over the past month. TEPCO also uses J Village to track every worker's cumulative exposure to radiation. They undergo regular checkups with a device called a whole body counter. The sensors can detect the presence of radioactive particles inside the body. They measure what's referred to as internal exposure. The screen says the results are normal. We also have more detailed figures. If the device detects an abnormally high level of radioactive particles, the worker goes immediately to hospital for further evaluation. Decommissioning the plant will take between 30 and 40 years. Failure to treat the worker's health as a top priority could compromise the entire operation. And Yuko, that operation is unprecedented and dangerous. I see. And as the TEPCO official has been telling you, worker safety obviously is a top priority there. But the levels of radiation are lethal in some places inside the plant. How do they strike a balance? Good question, Yuko. Well, it's impossible for humans to examine the reactors directly due to the high levels of radiation in some areas of the plant, as you just mentioned. So engineers are working to develop technology that will get them inside without the risk. NHK World's Noriko Okada explains. Right after the accident, TEPCO engineers sent a remote-controlled robot inside one of the reactor buildings. The device detected tremendously high levels of radiation, and it managed to make it out. Since then, TEPCO has used several robots to survey dangerous areas at the crippled plant. The utilities need for the technology has pushed developers to design robots that can go where humans cannot. Researchers and engineers are trying to make devices that can carry out more advanced decommissioning tasks. Some attended a convention in January. They are now focused on designing robots that can do decontamination work. This robot uses a laser technology to clean up the radioactive substances. The arm stick out of the device emits a beam. The laser can evaporate radioactive substances. Then the robot uses a vacuum to collect the radioactive dust. This model is designed to cut through rubble, which is littered inside reactor buildings because of the explosions. We're proud of this robot, which will be used in areas inside Fukushima Daiichi where no people can go. The most daunting challenge is removing extremely radioactive nuclear fuel from the damaged reactors. TEPCO officials say molten fuel burns through the damaged reactors and piles up at the bottom of the containment vessels. The fuel is inaccessible right now. Engineers are exploring ways to reach it. They are trying to develop a 30-meter-long robotic arm. It would have special sensors inside that would create a 3D picture 
so engineers could monitor its movements. Radiation could affect all electronic parts of the robot. So we have to overcome that hurdle. This institute is developing a laser for the robotic arm. Teams of engineers are working on one that would slice through the melted down nuclear fuel, which is now extremely hard. They also need the laser to work underwater. The reactors must be filled with water to shield the emission of radiation from the fuel. The institute ran an experiment using a mock reactor. The engineers injected gas into water to clear a path for the laser so the beam wouldn't weaken. Then they aimed the laser at the simulated fuel and managed to cut some of it. But the fuel at the Fukushima plant is expected to be more difficult to deal with. Some of it mixed with debris when it melted down, making it much harder than the simulated fuel. TEPCO engineers don't fully understand the condition it's in. This is a huge challenge. We have to combine techniques in ways that we have never tested before. Some combinations will work, but in other cases we will have to make fundamental adjustments. There are still many hurdles. Engineers haven't figured out how to collect and remove the fuel. And TEPCO workers would need to carry out the job in three reactors. For now, they know the technology they need is a long way away from being put into practice. Noriko Okada, NHK World. It's been three years since the accident, but in many ways we're still in the early stages of the recovery effort. Yuko?